what are the things that I really want in life, no matter how big or small they are, and trying to prioritize that list. And maybe letting go of some of the things that you thought you really needed, like me feeling important and powerful and accomplished and, you know, having this title, letting go of that was hard, but then it was something that I had to do in order to get to the things that I knew I really wanted. Hey there, I'm Goli Kalkaran, and this is Lessons from a Quitter, where we believe that it's never too late to start over. No matter how much time or money you've spent getting to where you are, if ultimately you are not happy then it's time to get out. If you're feeling stuck and you feel like there's got to be more, there's got to be a way to feel fulfilled and excited about what you do, then this is the podcast for you. Each week, I will sit down with an inspiring guest who quit their professional career in order to forge their own path and create a life that they love. Hey guys, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining me again today. I'm so excited because, well, one, we have a great show, but two, I finally got my act together and I'm starting to put together some resources to help you guys on your own journeys. So I'm going to start offering some free PDFs and things that I think might help you. Uh, we may do a live event in the summer, like a you know meetup, happy hour, whatever I can do to kind of help you along. And the first thing that I created is a PDF that has five steps that I took to figure out what I wanted to do after I decided I was going to quit the law. And the reason I made this first is because by far the number one question I get in every DM or email is, I want to quit, but I don't know what I would do. And I will say that a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on finding their passion. And I think that might be misguided. You're putting a lot of pressure on figuring out exactly what you need to be doing for the rest of your life. And a lot of times that takes a while to unfold and it takes a lot of time to unpack everything that you have created in your identity and all the stories that you have been programmed with for decades and decades. So it's not something that's going to show up immediately, but it is worth going on this journey of self-discovery and figuring out who you really are and what you really like and where your next step should be. So if you're interested in checking out this PDF, it's completely free. And like I said, it has the five steps that I took when I was trying to figure out who I really was and what I wanted to do. It's at Quitter Club. So now we're a club, guys, just in case you didn't know, quitterclub.com slash PDF. You can download it for free. And please give me feedback. Let me know what you think of it. If you go through the steps, let me know what you've come up with because, you know, the more feedback you give me, the better things I can create for you. So go ahead and download that and let me know. And on to the episode today. It is such a good one. We have Annie Jensen Chapur, and she is one half of the duo behind the incredibly beautiful customizable home accessory line, Taja Collection. Annie and her partner, Annabelle, were both lawyers. They had found themselves at the same big law firm in Miami, And they were both unhappy in that role, looking for something else. And she will talk about how this need came up for personalized gifts, and it led them down this path of creating these incredibly beautiful candles and other accessories that they've now created into a wonderful brand and company called the Taja Collection. You should definitely check them out on Instagram, and you can check out my Instagram I will show you guys the candle that they sent me that was customized with lessons from a quitter. It's so beautiful. I felt like an influencer when I got something in the mail and I you know, was a little too excited to be honest with you, but um, it is incredibly beautiful. And they're so kind because they're offering you guys, my uh, listeners, a 15% discount off of anything from their site. So Go to their website and use Goalie15 as the coupon code to get 15% off their incredibly beautiful things. But before you do that, let's jump in and talk to Annie about this amazing story of how her and Annabelle created such an incredible company. Hi, Annie. Thank you so much for joining me. Of course. Thank you for having me. I am so excited to have you and to talk about the beautiful products that you guys are creating. But 
let's start from the beginning. And why don't you tell me like a little bit about what led you to law school and what your career as a lawyer looked like? So my mom is a lawyer and I think growing up, I just idolized her and always saw, you know, how much she loved her job, how powerful she felt in her job. I always saw how in her element she was. So I saw that and thought, oh, that's what I want. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be like mom. So that's always kind of what led me to being a lawyer is kind of idolizing my mom and wanting to be like that. So it was kind of like a no brainer. I was on the path to becoming a lawyer you know, always thinking about how can I get there quicker, faster, better, Mm -hmm. and really kind of lacked self-awareness to ever take a break and be like, hey, do I like this? Is this going to make me happy? Am I enjoying this? So I was just like straight to the finish line, didn't look left or right the whole way. Yeah. And did your mom, what kind of law did she practice? And I mean, was she happy that you wanted to be a lawyer? You know, it's so funny that you ask that question because looking back now, And without exaggerating, every single lawyer that I mentioned to at any point, whether I was in undergrad or law school, always said, don't do it. (laughs) Don't do it. She wasn't happy. I mean, she was proud of me and proud of all my accomplishments and my achievements, but she was never fully on board. And strangely, when I told her I was going to quit, she was 100% behind me. Oh my God, that's so funny. The reason I asked that is because I had kind of the opposite situation where like, I didn't really know any lawyers when I was going. And I had the experience that everyone I would meet just in passing would kind of try to talk me out of going to law school. And I never understood at the time. And so I wondered, you know, if I had somebody that was a lawyer, like, would they sit me down and kind of tell me what the reality of the practice is? And so I can understand why, you know, she maybe didn't want you to go down that road. So it's interesting though, that, you know, even having that, like that identity and that pull is so strong to kind of have that quote unquote success and be that powerful person that you wanted to become, like how how much that kind of blinds us to what the reality of it is. True. So crazy. Yeah. So you, you go to undergrad and you go to law school, you're going straight through for this finish line. And like, was there any point, you know, in law school or was it like not until you actually started practicing that you really started thinking like, hey, maybe this isn't the right choice? No point. The whole time, (laughs) I mean, before I even went to law school, I clerked at the law firm that I ended up working at. and I loved it. I had a great experience. I was a summer associate. I mean, I I just had my eyes on the prize. And it was always like, you know, from the time you're a kid, it's like you want to get to the next achievement, get to the next thing. And so I think I was just like so happy to be like checking those boxes. Right. At what point does it start kind of sinking in? What what did your career look like when you start saying like, hey, maybe this isn't for me? It was a weird feeling because I got to the main finish line, right? Like I got my dream job Mm. at the dream law firm in the department that I wanted to be in, you know, working for the people that I wanted to work for. And it didn't feel good. Like it didn't feel right. Something was off. I just felt it in my gut. Like this isn't right. Right. And so it was a weird time for me because I had never felt that way. And so it was, you know, processing, trying to figure out, you know, I couldn't imagine a life for myself that didn't involve me being a corporate lawyer at this particular law firm. Oh, interesting. Like we're down to the law firm that you wanted to be at. Wow. And it's funny. I mean, that's a very relatable thing, right? I think every one of us in careers that we are, find ourselves unhappy had the same things where, I mean, in anything, we all feel like when I get to this, then it'll be amazing. Or once I have right, this, right, it'll exactly. be my dream. And you get there and you're like, oh, this isn't what I thought Wait, it would what? be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you start having these inklings. And then we should also note, so you have a partner in your current business. She was also a lawyer that was at this law firm that you were working at. And so did you guys know each other before the law firm? No, it's weird because we both went to NYU undergrad and we both went to the University of Miami Law School, but we didn't meet until we started at uh, the same law firm as first year associates. So um. we met at orientation and she ended up working in the litigation department and I was in the corporate department Mm -hmm. and we just hit it off. And we, we weren't talking about, you know, doing something, but she was always very entrepreneurial in spirit. Mm -hmm. And that was something that kind of scared me because, you know, if, if you have familiarity with kind of big law firm culture, it's like, it's strange because everybody's dying to get in there. But then once you get there, 
everybody's dying to get out. <laughs> right. And I never understood that. Like I was always like, I'm just so happy to be here. Mm. I just wanted, I was drinking the Kool-Aid. Yeah. You know, I was like, what do I got to do to be a partner? How can I, you know, attend more networking events? How can I be more involved? How can I add more value? And so hearing people complain or talk about exiting felt really selfish and mm. ungrateful for the opportunity, you know, especially, you know, there's so many people in my law school, especially that, you know, didn't have jobs yeah. or, you know, didn't have the opportunity. So it felt really weird. Like I didn't even want to indulge those thoughts. Interesting. You know, like thinking about thinking about leaving something that was so prestigious. Right. Well, that's such an interesting point because I do think a lot of people, it's like, not only are you unhappy in what you're doing, but there's this extra level of guilt that like you should be grateful. You should be appreciative yes. because it's, especially if it's a high paying job or a prestigious, you know, quote unquote successful job because like so many people want that or so many people think that that's such a great gig. And I think that is what keeps a lot of people stuck because it's like, oh, boo hoo, you have this incredible six figure job and you're complaining. Right. And I love the law firm that I was working for. And I love the people I was working for. And I felt especially grateful because I know how much money and time they invest, especially for people who are, you know, summer associates like I was. So I had right. really been like with them from the start, they had invested a lot of mm -hmm. money to try to recruit me. So I just felt that added layer of guilt, like, oh, I'm going to leave. And you know, how am I going to break it to them? And so if you did like love the law firm and you love the people and you felt that this is such a gift and uh, such a prestigious career, why did you want to leave? It's funny. So I actually had the opportunity to work on an amazing deal, which was the public sale of Yahoo when different companies were bidding. And I worked out of New York in the New York office working on, you know, a super high profile deal. I was a first year associate being, you know, the, the associate running the deal. It was amazing. You know, it was a dream. And I was working for the most amazing attorneys on the deal who were so grateful, you know, so gracious to work with, so fun, interesting. And, and I wasn't happy. I didn't like the work. It wasn't just that I saw that a lot of people were unhappy and that was kind of like, oh, okay, I had the signs before, you know, what yeah. everyone was telling me, don't do it, don't do it. And now I'm here and I see that everyone's unhappy. I don't know why I thought I would be different, but then I'm actually doing all the things that are the best things that you could be doing as a first year associate. And I'm not enjoying it. And I don't see, you know, a finish line where I'm going to be happy on in the day to day. So it was the actual work where you're realizing like, this isn't what I want to be doing every single day. And like, no matter exactly. how great the people around me are, like, it's not something that's going to fulfill me. And nothing was keeping me up at night. I mean, I even had those experiences in law school or, you know, when you're passionate about anything, you know, I'm, I'm definitely a nerd and I could stay up at night just thinking about a case or a paper that I was working on. And just, you know, when something has you by the neck and you're so excited and you're just like, oh my God. I can't wait to start working on it or working through it. I just didn't have that. Yeah. But I mean, you have worked so hard to get these degrees and you've put in so much time and money going to school and law school and getting here. And this is your first year. And so I think so many of us kind of ignore those inklings or say like, okay, maybe it'll get better. Or maybe I should try to find another place, you know, like I should go in-house or I should do, you know, were you kind of thinking of like, I don't want to say like salvaging this career. I think a little bit, a lot of people are like, I should make it work somehow. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Why? I don't know why. It was like, once I realized I'm a very like black and white person, like once I realized it was like, okay, no, this is not for me. Like got to find a new path forward. Got to figure it out. Got to find a way. And, and I left before we even started Taja. So I left about, you know, eight months before we really got things going. Like once I knew it wasn't for me, I couldn't do it. If I'm not happy where I am, I have to get out. That's incredible though. Like, can we just pause for that? Because <laughs> I mean, one of the biggest stumbling blocks I see from people from myself, from the, you know, dozens and dozens of people that I've talked to now on the podcast is you may know it. You may know inside deep down, like 
you know, a lot of people know they're miserable, but those fears, what people will think, all this stuff yes. keeps you desperate for make, to make it work. And so people stay for years and years, especially I think when you are so new to it, like you've spent all this time becoming a lawyer and you're in your first year, you know? So there's so many people that are like, well, I got to keep pushing. And so to have that clarity to say like, no, this is not it. And as an aside, I think that's the right way. You know, it's like, why waste any more time if you already know that it's not for you? But that is, you know, a hundred times easier said than done. It's like everything in you is screaming, stay the course, you know? <laughs> right. And listen, my partner, Annabelle, didn't do, and she was way more entrepreneurial than me. Um, she didn't. She always had in her mind, okay, when we have our first sale, then I'm giving him my notice. And that's what she did. Okay, so let's go now to, you are starting to have this inkling that you don't want to do law or like this isn't going to fulfill you. She's clearly having, I'm assuming, the same things. And you were saying she practiced for a little longer. You were telling me before she clerked for a judge as well and then was working at this firm, right? Exactly. And so she's also feeling like this. So like, how do you guys even come up with the idea that you want to start a business? And like, how did you come up with the idea for your business? So we started at the law firm in the fall of that year, August or September, and it was the holidays of that year. And as a first year associate, you're super lucky that you have an assistant. And we both really loved our assistants. And so it was the time where we were choosing what to buy them as a holiday present. And if you have familiarity with corporate America, there's a lot of rules. You can gift up, you can't gift down, blah, 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 what you can spend, what kind of category, what have other people gifted their assistance? Mm -hmm. You don't want to do more or less. So there's like all these politics. So by the time we had uh, kind of like the limitations set out, we, we were stuck kind of like with candles, which we both loved candles and both of our assistants loved candles. And it was something that we, you know, would speak about frequently with them because Annabelle and I both love design. And we had our offices designed with, you know, diffusers and candles and everything organized and clean. So it was kind of like a common area of interest between us. And so we started looking for a way to make the candle more thoughtful than just like, oh, here's the candle, you know, thanks. So we were thinking, oh, you know, my assistant had kids and I wanted to engrave the names of her kids and kind of put like a personal message thanking her. And Annabelle's assistant loved cats. So we wanted to do something related to that. So we were searching and searching for a way to kind of personalize the candles in some way, and we couldn't find it. So after that, we just couldn't stop thinking about it. Then it, like I said, you know, once you have something that keeps you up at night, I wouldn't, I couldn't sleep. I would (laughs) be thinking about this and thinking about how could we do it? Would it be like a label? How could we personalize it? Why hasn't this been done? And it just really had me by the throat. I couldn't stop thinking about it. And so it was maybe like six months or so after that, I waited until that deal I mentioned before was over. So I didn't leave anybody on that deal hanging. Mm -hmm. But as soon as that deal was over, I gave my notice and I was like, I want to do this. So when you gave your notice, I mean, where were you in this process? Like, had you decided on what the business was going to be? Had you started the business or was it like you gave your notice so that you could then just explore how to turn this into a business? No, we had done almost nothing. I I think that at least for me, leaving created that urgency. It had been something like, you know, we ordered like a candle making kit on Amazon one weekend and we made candles. Oh, we could do this. Or, you know, we would brainstorm names. We had kind of like a Google Doc that we would share ideas on, but there was like nothing concrete happening at all. Wow. Okay. And so you quit without having like anything in place. I mean, had you prepared financially to give yourself like a runway some time before you needed to work again? Yes. And what did that look like for you? Luckily, my husband and I spoke about it together and he was comfortable kind of like carrying the load for both of us until, you know, things picked up. But I'm, I mean, I was lucky that I had that to fall back on. So really quickly before we go that past that, like, so what was the reaction? Like your husband, you said your mom was obviously supportive, but I have to imagine like people at the law firm or your friends or when you tell people like, hey, I'm quitting and I don't know, I mean, I might start this business. I don't know what I'm going to do that you had to get like weird looks of like, what? <laughs> 
You know, I, I didn't tell anybody what I was doing when I quit, if I'm completely honest. I just quit and I would say, you know, oh, you know, I um, think I'm going to like work for the family business. Or I'm going to take a little time off to figure it out. Like, I don't know. You know, my dad really needs some help. And so I was very vague. Mm. I, I didn't feel comfortable telling anybody anything. And I do think that maybe that was a mistake and a little insecurity on my part. But I was kind of just like deflecting and avoiding it whenever anybody would bring it up. Well, actually, it's funny because that has come up a number of times. And I I did the same thing. And I used, I hate to say it's an excuse. It wasn't an excuse. I had a baby. And so I was at home with my baby. But I wasn't telling people that I wasn't going back to law. Like I was just saying like, oh, I'm taking some time to be with my baby. (laughs) And yes, like maybe it's not the most courageous thing to do, but I know a couple of other guests that we've had on, sometimes it's nice to kind of protect yourself and your ideas so that you don't have to defend them when you don't exactly know what you're doing. And it gives you that space to kind of breathe. And especially if like you're a type of person like me, I'm a big people pleaser. And, you know, and I, at that time I've worked on it since, but it would really make me uncomfortable and feel like I have to defend myself. And sometimes it's nice to not have to do that. It's so true. And, you know, even the people closest to you, and I I, I try to be so self-aware with myself about it now, because, you know, you can meet somebody that you don't know at all, and they tell you an idea, and you think, wow, like, that's great, good for them, you're going to do amazing. But then, you know, your brother tells you something, and you're like, well, what about this? And what about that regulation? And have you thought about this? And, you know, it's like, you you want the best for them. It could be the same idea. But I, I don't know if it's that you feel more comfortable voicing your concerns to the people closer to you. So I definitely got a lot of that to like the first few people I mentioned I was going to be making candles to. So I was like, you know what? We're, we're just not going to do that. Yeah, right now. that's very smart. And I always say this too, like a lot of times it's coming from a good place. They want you to be safe. They want you 100%. to, you know, and so they're, they don't want you to do something. It's the, your own conditioned fears. Like everybody has these fears. You hear all these stats of like, of businesses go out of business or whatever. And so when someone is telling you like your good friend or your sister or your cousin is saying like, I'm going to start this business, you want to protect them. And you're like, well, are you sure? You know, so it can be like very hard to deal with when you already don't know exactly what you're doing and you're building up the confidence. So I think that's actually like kind of a smart move is to not have to share it with, you know, maybe share with the people you have to, like your husband, you're quitting, right. you got to yeah. talk to him, you know, but um, I told him, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what did he think about you like leaving law after a year? I mean, he was so supportive. I, I think I'm kind of downplaying how hard that first year was for yeah. me in the law firm. So he was really amazing that year as I had a major identity crisis, you know, realizing that the thing I had been working towards my whole life was kind of not panning out the way I wanted it to. Yeah. And kind of like figuring out what that was going to look like and mean for me. And he definitely stood by me through, you know, not the best versions of myself throughout that year. Mm. So he was really happy that I had just made a decision and he was going to stand by whatever that was, whether it was like candles or otherwise. That's incredible. And when you say candles or otherwise, was there a part of you that ever thought like, well, if this doesn't work, I'll go back to law? Or was it like, I'm going to do this. And then if this doesn't work, it's the next thing. The next thing for sure. That is incredible. And so what about your partner though in this? Like, did she quit at the same time or how did that work? So she quit almost a year after me. So she quit once we had received our first deposit for our first sale. Oh, okay. So was she working on this like, you know, nights and weekends or how, how did you guys split it up? Exactly. Okay. And so were you doing the majority of the work at that time kind of to set this up? I wouldn't say so because at that time it, it definitely felt like I was working all the time, but now that we're actually in business, you know, we were doing equal work. It, mm. We we didn't even have a product. We were, you know, doing a lot of research, trying to find out how to make this idea pan out. Yeah. So it, it felt like I was doing work all the time, but we, we were definitely equally contributing. Okay. Even though she was working full time as a lawyer. Wow, that's impressive. And so, I know. you know, getting to that portion, how did you figure out like how to create this business, how to make the candles, how to, you know, marketing, sales, all that stuff? I mean, you've, you'd never done any of that, right? 
Right. I think that is the amazing thing about being a lawyer that has come with both of us is that we both have this attitude that there's nothing that we can't figure out. Mm. You know, we were thrown into things as first year associates also in law school. I'm sure you know, too, that, you know, you're kind of like the impossible. Mm -hmm. And so you learn to be really resourceful. So there's no problem that comes up. And we've had so many problems, but there's no problem that comes up that we don't you know, quickly come up with a, a, like a decisive decision mm. for a solution and just start working on it. That's awesome. And I do think that is the entire game. Like I, it's come up a lot on this podcast, but I really want people to understand that, that like everybody that comes on the show or everyone that's taking these jumps, like they didn't know what they were doing or they don't know what the path is, but it's having that confidence in yourself that you're going to figure it out. Like that's it. A hundred percent. Okay. So you guys start figuring this out and like how many years ago did you start this? And can you tell us a little bit like what the business is and where it's now? So we started about a year and a half ago. And one smart thing that we did, speaking about kind of like the launching phase was we started our social media before we actually had our our products. So we had about two samples of our candles, one in black, one in white. And we just started taking pictures of them everywhere and kind of teasing it on Instagram and Facebook and social media. So, you know, I would have friends call me and be like, oh, my God, you have candles everywhere. And like they didn't know that it was the same two candles, you know, (laughs) just being like wiped out with like a little baby wipe and clean to like retake another picture of. Um, I love that. So we did that and we generated kind of some buzz in at least in locally in Miami. And so we started getting a lot of inquiries from different boutiques about our candles. So that's how we got our first sale before we even had our products, before we even knew how to make candles, which is another funny story. (laughs) But our original concept was that we were going to do direct to consumer only from our website to completely custom candles, vases, and diffusers. So we went to a, a laser trade show that I had just gotten really lucky Googling weird things like how to engrave on glass, you know, whatever. I took my two samples in my backpack to that trade show, which luckily happened to be in Fort Lauderdale and just started taking them to different booths and being like, Hey, if I wanted to engrave a message on this candle, how could I do it? What types of machines would work? And the nicest people at that trade show just you know, even though they weren't going to get a sale, would just take me over to another booth of their friend, Bob, and Bob would show me how he could do it. And then I would go see Tim and Tim would show me how we could do it on his laser. And so eventually we found the machine that was going to give us the look and feel that we wanted. So it was around, I would say like maybe May, two years ago that we, you know, pulled the trigger, put in the investment to buy the machinery that we were going to need and place the order for the raw materials, for the candles. We do all the manufacturing ourselves. Oh, wow, you do? Yes. (laughs) Oh, that's so interesting. So Yes, I mean, being a control freak, yeah, we just (laughs) want to do it all ourselves. And so you guys had to learn, I'm assuming, how to make candles and like you make different scented stuff. Yeah. Step one was we went to different candle manufacturers. We went to a couple in Florida and then one that's supposed to be the best in California. And then one thing that I was noticing when I was there is that it's all human labor. There were no like fancy machines or special equipment being used for these candles, even at scale. So I was thinking, you know, there's no reason why we can't do it ourselves. And it's only going to be an asset to us to be able to know how to do this ourselves. And then we're not going to be beholden to some company who says, you know, oh, you know, wax prices increased or whatever. We could kind of control our destiny. So I think I mentioned before we bought like an Amazon candle learning kit and we did that. And in that kit was like, you know, a candle the size of like a tea light. And, you know, first pour nailed it. We're like, oh, we got this. Like, We know how to make candles. Like done. And we never did it again. We're like, oh, check. We know how to make candles. So, so then fast forward to, you know, back to your original question, how, how did we get started? So we got that first sale from a local boutique, which wasn't even part of our business plan, but we're like, you know, just say yes to anything. And if they want to buy our candles, perfect. So our candles uh, for reference are huge. And at that time we only had the large size. So the large size burns for uh, four hours. It's a square shape with, it's about like four and a half inches on each side and has four wicks. 
So I remember actually Annabelle was on her honeymoon and I was making these candles in my house. And I mean, it just was not happening. A, a candle that size is not the same as pouring like a tiny little tea light. Mm. I was like freaking out. Like, oh, what am I going to do? <laughs> my husband was like, you have to pay someone to make these candles. Cause like, you can't burn yourself. You can't like lose your first <laughs> client and like not deliver. So I was like, how am I going to tell Annabelle that we have to pay somebody else to make these candles and lose money on our first sale. And You know, luckily by the end of the week, I had figured it out. I mean, I was like using like my hair blow dryer, putting the candles in the oven, like doing all kinds of weird things until we finally figured out how to do it. That's so funny. I love that. And so like now, do you guys still do it like out of your house or do you have a space? Do you have employees? Like what does it look like at this point? So we moved out of my house after six months, which at the time felt like we had been working out of my house forever. But thinking about it now, it's like, wow, we did that really quickly. So we we got our own space and now we do have three full-time employees. That's incredible. And you guys have managed, I see like you have gotten a ton of press. So you were on like Good Morning America or the Today Show, I guess. And, and yeah, some, the Today Show thing. So how did you guys get that stuff? Do you do that yourself or do you have someone that does PR for you? A mixture of both. So a really good friend of mine does PR. And so she, I mean, for free would just pitch me to her clients. And it didn't really pan out at first, but, you know, once we started getting some steam, you know, it was like an influx of people just really wanting to to tell the world about us, which was amazing. And we were so lucky to have. So even though we do get pitched a lot for, you know, PR companies that, you know, would want to be on retainer, it's like, I just, I love the idea of harnessing that kind of like local female network that you have because they just do such a good job. Absolutely. I love that. I mean, you've mentioned it twice now. And I think even when you were talking about that trade show that you went to, again, another reoccurring theme that happens in like every one of these podcasts I do, and it was my own situation, is just the power of like meeting people and talking to people and networking. And it's incredible how much people are willing to help and want to help if you put yourself out there. But you have to like stop thinking and sitting by yourself. Like you have to get out there and actually do and people will meet you. Like, it seems like it's like, I'm not saying it is luck. And it seems like when you listen to these stories, like, Oh, all these people were just lucky, but that's not it. It's like, you put yourself out there and one person introduces you to the next who introduces you to the next. And it just makes things happen. And a lot of times it doesn't work out. And then those one times it does, it's incredible. Right. And it's also doing it more than you receive it. Yeah. So it's, you know, putting people together where you're going to get no gain from it, taking the time to, you know, draft those tough emails for your friends or, you know, listen to their presentations and all of that stuff. It comes back to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it makes you feel good to help other people. So you have to imagine that there's other people out there that are going to feel good from connecting you. Like the Today Show, for example, that came from a client of ours who had a friend who worked on the show and she was just so happy and so excited to, to connect us. That's amazing. So, I mean, even the fact that you guys have three full-time employees is so impressive for only be doing this for a year and a half or two years, you know, that's very like large growth. And it's funny because when you guys reached out to me on Instagram, like my initial thought when I first got the message, it was like, oh, we have this story. Like we were these lawyers and we started this candle company. I thought this, I was like, oh, another candle company. And then I looked at your page and it's stunning because I really was wondering like, how can it be different? And it's, I mean, I really, really encourage all of you listening to go check out their Instagram. And uh, your Instagram handle is Taja Collection, right? Yes. It's T-A-J-A Collection. I'll have it in the show notes. But it is so stunning. And, you know, I I know we've kind of touched on it, but just to give people a little more, you can personalize, like, anything on these candles. You can put designs and pictures and whatever words. Exactly. So that was – thank you so much for saying that, by the way. That means a lot. So, so yeah, that, I mean, that's the whole thing we're trying to do. We we're a candle company in theory, but we like to think of ourselves as a gifting company because Mm -hmm. mostly what people are doing is thoughtful gifting. And that's kind of what we're trying to redefine in the market is, you know, no limitations on anything. So with mother's day coming up, it comes to mind. Like if you wanted to buy your mom a candle and write, you know, like a really heartfelt message on the inside of the lid, like we're not going to put a limitation on how many characters that you, you can write to her. Or if you wanted to put a picture of your dog 
because you're a dog mom or anything. It's, you know, it's not a monogram, although we do do a lot of monograms as well. It's really just personalization, like possibilities are endless. We say no no, no, to almost nothing. (laughs) They're so beautiful. And, but so how do you guys, can you do like bigger orders or do people do multiples or is it all one off like a personalized candle? Great question. So, so after we launched and after we got through that first sale to the boutique and we launched our website, you know, that was our original plan. Like, okay, just direct to consumer on our website. You know, we're just going to have organic growth and we're going to control everything. We're controlling the supply, the manufacturer, and we will have control over our customer. And then because of Instagram and because of where Instagram was at the time, I think it's changed a little bit, but we would get all of these people reaching out to us saying, Hey, do you do corporate? And you know, we, we say no to nothing. So we were like, Oh yeah, definitely. We do corporate. So we quickly came up with, you know, corporate pricing and we got really luckily really great wholesale partners in, you know, sports teams like the Miami heat, lots of local hotels, like the Eden rock and the Nobu hotel. So we got really lucky with that. And it was this whole area of the business that we hadn't envisioned and that we didn't know existed just by not being afraid of entering into something we didn't know. So that was definitely like a huge part of the business that we didn't envision. And now as we're entering into almost our third year, we're about to embark upon resale. So selling wholesale for resale. So normally, other than that first one-off boutique, we normally say no to retail partners, not because we have anything against them, just because we can't make it work um, with our margins Mm. to make it as thoughtful and personal as we want. You know, we don't want to just be like another monogram candle. We really want to make it personal and thoughtful to whoever is placing that order. So now that we're able to do that, that's a new kind of direction that we're going in and going back to what we were talking about before. So in order to kind of launch into that world, we're going to be showing at a trade show in August. And, you know, I just wrote a few lines in like a couple groups that I'm in on Facebook and the Female Founders Collective, just saying like, hey, has anyone done trade shows? Like, anybody done this particular trade show, like any tips or anything. And like, this is something I I don't use social media that often. So this is so not me to be like that person (laughs) who's like writing on Facebook, like (laughs) looking for recommendations. But I mean, we have this Google doc internally and like the whole team, like we look at it and we're just so shocked at how generous people are with information and their time and like writing these really long and in-depth emails with amazing tips I mean, if anybody listening is going to this trade show, the New York Now show, like reach out to me, I'll share it with you. I mean, it is incredible. That is wonderful. And I've said it before too. I mean, a lot of these Facebook groups and forums, there's so many places to get help and to just like put things out and there's people willing to share what they know. And, you know, sometimes it can be overwhelming because there's so much information out there, but it really is something that you can figure out if you, you just have to spend the time. So I love that you're highlighting that. And I also think that you raised a really important point because again, there's no way to know what your business is going to look like. You know, it always changes and new opportunities arise and you start thinking of different avenues and there's no way of envisioning that right when you start out. So it's like starting and kind of pivoting with what you see is working and isn't working. Right. And it's easier said than done too. And I can say, I'm so lucky to have a partner like Annabelle who really, you know, she is so patient with me because I am a perfectionist. So it's not like we got that call from the Miami heat and I was like, let's go. I was like, you know, I I will focus on these like irrational details, like, but we don't have like, you know, custom stationery yet or folders or how are we going to go to the meeting without, you know, this or that. And she'll just be like, she'll listen to the whole thing and be like, you know, we're going to be fine. We're going to do it. They're not going to notice your stationary, (laughs) you know, and and she's right every time. And and now we have those kind of, you know, examples to look back on when something new comes along. She'll be like, remember when we were scared and we didn't think we could do it, but we did, it's going to be like that. And I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, you're right. It's going to be like that. That's awesome. And I think that it's really helpful to have, you know, obviously two minds are better than one and having that support, but I also hear from a lot of people that working with somebody as a partner is like a marriage and it takes a lot of work. So how do you guys navigate your roles and make it work for you? I mean, we're really lucky. I think from the start, 
even though we didn't know each other for so long, we just had a, a trust that has never been broken. And I just know that I can trust her and I trust her values and her morals. And I think she feels the same way about me. So, you know, that, you know, she has my best interest at heart, no matter what. Yeah. And then I think going through that experience of, you know, being disappointed in your career forced me to be really self-aware, not only in that aspect in my life, but in other aspects of my life. So I can, you know, I'm not perfect, but I can, if I'm feeling stressed or I feel like I'm about to, you know, say something not nice or not be generous, I can take a minute and think like, what's really going on here? Like, what am I really upset about? Why is this really bothering me? Because it's not about the fact that, you know, like the conference table is messy because like, who cares? It's not what I'm really upset about. Right. You know, so I can, you know, excuse myself and be like, oh, I know why it's because I'm a control freak. I'm (laughs) like, you know, I'm worried that, you know, I wasn't the first one in the office this morning and I like to, you know, be the hardest worker And that's not really sustainable. So like get over it and like who cares? Right. That's great advice. So now what are you guys kind of really excited about or looking forward to? You're saying you're going to do retail, but what does like the horizon look like for you? So we're really excited about this trade show, especially for the retail aspect and also just getting to meet customers in person, even if it is, you know, B2B customers, other businesses, you know, since a lot of our sales are online. We don't get to interact with our customers Mm -hmm. in real life as often as we would like to. So we're really excited about that. So in the short term, that's what we're most excited about. But long term, you know, we have a really kind of like a long term vision of redefining custom gifting. And so, you know, we have a lot of plans for taking this national Uh, We're working with our laser manufacturer to come up with a system that would make you know, kind of on the spot customization feasible in other places other than, you know, our HQ in Miami. So that's something that we're working on long term, but we don't want to do that until we get it right. right. So that's, you know, maybe like realistically more like a three to five year plan. Very cool. And what would you say has, I guess, been the hardest part of this journey and what was, what has been the best part for you? Oh, that's a tough one. The hardest part of the journey, I think, was that first part when I, you know, before I had decided to really take the leap where I was struggling Mm -hmm. with my identity and figuring out what this meant for me and who was I if I wasn't, you know, like an accomplished lawyer. I, I didn't feel a lot of insecurity once I had made that decision, but kind of getting there was really tough. I mean, the best part is, you know, first of all, like we see the most thoughtful stuff and it's a bummer that Annabelle wasn't able to be on with us because she is the most thoughtful person I've ever met. As a point of reference, when I was uh, pregnant, you know, you have those little apps that tell you each week, like what your um, baby is, right? It's like a blueberry this week or whatever this week, it's um, a strawberry and like, you know, I would send her, she would follow along with me to see what size I was. Every single week, she would bring me an on theme gift. So it would be like blueberry granola. I mean, she is just like beyond. So being able to work with her and kind of like go through this journey together is by far the best part. But then kind of ancillary to that is being a part of so many thoughtful presents. Like, you know, I try to look through every order that comes in. I do it at least once or twice a week at night when I'm in bed, just kind of like look through the messages. And I'm so inspired by the messages that people are writing. And, you know, these are for people that are going through cancer or experiencing loss. And people are just so thoughtful and nice and generous. And, you know, especially with everything going on in the world now, you can feel a little down and that mm-hmm. always brings me up and it's so rewarding to see those people because I, I, I'm weird with names I have a photographic memory so then I'll see those people that receive the gifts they become customers oh yeah no I bet that and so it's really fun to see that come full circle that's so beautiful I guess the last question is like what advice would you give somebody that is where you were you know when you were stuck in that law firm and had this identity crisis and doesn't like what they're doing but is just scared Oh, I think step one is just, you know, uh, I've mentioned it so many times and I'll try to give some tangible advice working on self-awareness and maybe 
a way to start with that is just making a list of like 10, 12 things that you want. Mm. And sometimes it can be scary to do that because making that list, first of all, means admitting maybe you're not there yet Mm. or maybe like, okay, well now here are the things written down. Like what if I don't get them, Mm. you know, but I think just sitting down and really thinking about like, what are the things that I really want in life, no matter how big or small they are and trying to prioritize that list and maybe letting go of some of the things that you thought you really needed, like me feeling important and powerful and accomplished and, you know, having this title, letting go of that was hard, but then it was something that I had to do in order to get to the things that I knew I really wanted. So sometimes seeing it out on paper, at least for me, I'm really visual, can be really helpful. That is great advice. Can you let everybody know where they can find you guys or you know, if they want to check out your candles or even maybe contact you guys where they can do that? Yes. You can do everything through our Instagram at Taja Collection, T-A-J-A Collection, no S. And um, we're on there a lot, but if we miss a message, they'll definitely shoot it our way so that we get to it. Perfect. Thank you so much, Annie. I really appreciate you being here. Of course. Thank you. This was great. How cool is Annie's story? Here are my three takeaways. One, sometimes you just have to jump. Now, this won't be the decision for everybody, but some of us have to recognize that if we stay in our comfort zone, We will stay there forever. So sometimes you have to take that leap and figure it out as you go along. Two, have the confidence that you will figure it out. The path is never clear at the beginning. It only becomes clear through action. So you can't have it figured out before you start it. You just have to kind of go and see where it leads you. And three, invest in your network. People are willing to help when you're also willing to help them. Like, you know, what goes around comes around. So invest in authentic relationships. Focus on your network. Build it up. And you will be surprised how much it serves you. With that, I will see you guys next time. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for listening. I can't tell you how much it means to me. If you liked the podcast, please rate and review us on iTunes. It'll help other people find the show. If you want to connect or reach out, follow along on Instagram and Facebook at Lessons from a Quitter and on Twitter at Quitter Podcast. I would love to hear from you guys and I'll see you on the next episode.